To be completely honest, this was supposed to be a normal day. How was I meant to know the magnitude of the tragedy I was about to witness? Some people would argue that in my line of work, there aren't normal days. But I disagree. See, I was there when some of the most incredible scientific achievements in recent years took place. I cheered for the team that cured cancer. I shook hands with the pilots who returned from outside our solar system. I was even part of the initial team behind current teleportation experiments. I know what an extraordinary day is supposed to look like in the scientific world. This? This wasn't meant to be one of them. At least, that was what I thought at first. I would soon be obliged to watch, to watch horrors beyond my comprehension. Oh, um, first things first. My name is Dr. Sarah McKenzie. After the teleportation project took off, I became hungry for discovering new things. I didn't want to just develop something. I wanted to make a new discovery. Using the leverage of that recent success, I managed to find the funding and support for the studies of other dimensions. Nowadays, it isn't as complicated as it sounds. The theory is there. We just needed someone brave enough to get their hands dirty on putting in the work. So, I did. I gathered a team. I filled a laboratory. We built the structure of the portal. And we started tinkering with atoms. When the time would come, we would ignite a controlled explosion in the portal and we would have access to a different dimension of which we knew nothing about yet. So, um, this day, yeah, this day was just meant for checking in. I was just making sure everything was clean, running steadily, still in place. Then I was interrupted by my second in command, Dr. Eddie Scott. Sarah, I have bad news, Eddie told me. That... <laughs> that is the last thing that a scientist working in a delicate field wants to hear. I tried to deflect using humor. Oh, don't tell me you still want to quit your job over some silly nightmares, I said to him. Some of our colleagues had warned us that messing with atoms and dimensions was too delicate a subject. They said we might ignite something before we even realized it. I believe they were just envious. They spit out words along with lines of radiation, energy waves, nervous system contamination, malign biological consequences, blah, blah, blah. I, you know, I just tried to soothe my team's worries. But just a couple of days later, Eddie showed up to work claiming that he was feeling sick, having nightmares, or even saying he had visions. He said some horribly disturbing things. He talked about moving shadows, changes in his body that disappeared in a second, dreams of creatures beyond imagination. Eddie insisted that it was ineffective working so closely with our experiment. I barely managed to comfort and distract him enough to get him to keep working with me. I, damn it, I wish, I, I just, oh, I wish he would have told me that the visions have gotten worse. I wish he would have just said how scared he was. How awful he felt about the energy in the lab that day. This time, however, before Eddie could reply seriously or, or with a joke, we were interrupted. Good afternoon, a woman called out, strolling into my lab as if it were her home. Excuse the interruption, Sarah. Eddie, my name is Agent Carter, Jean Carter. I'm from the CIA and I come bearing unfortunate news about the future of your project. I stepped forward with a frown, ignoring the way Eddie hissed quietly as if in sudden pain. Good afternoon, Jean. My name is Dr. McKenzie, and this is my partner, Dr. Scott. I would happily welcome you to our lab, but you lack the protective gear and experience, so I'm going to ask you to leave immediately. I won't do that, Sarah, the ruthless woman replied without batting an eyelash. 
I'm afraid our government has decided that your little interdimensional adventure is taking excessive time, money, and risks. We can't afford to maintain your project any longer. You have to shut it all down immediately, and then we'll proceed with the paperwork. What followed wasn't very pretty. The lady from the CIA and I got into a pretty heated discussion. I was ready to defend my experiment with tooth and nail, but she was a woman on a mission. She wasn't there to negotiate. She was mostly worried about how expensive everything was, while I tried to reassure her that it would be worth the wait. I was just trying to make everything safe enough. But we were barely listening to each other. It is no wonder that we failed to pay attention to the quiet doom. The quiet doom that was growing all around us. It started with Eddie. He attempted to listen to us and participate, but he hissed and groaned and groaned. Overcome by a terrible headache, his face was flushed and sweaty, but underneath it, he was turning frighteningly pale. He was growing weak, so he opted to take a seat. His eyes were distant, and they nervously darted around the room. Occasionally, he would ball his hands into fists and press them to his closed eyes, as if trying to rid himself of new visions. Eventually, he broke down. Sarah! Eddie yelled my name and put an end to our mindless argument about business. I can't take it anymore! He exclaimed. What do you mean? As soon as I asked him, my scientific partner and best friend doubled over in pain and started throwing up on the floor of the lab. I cursed our luck, but I forgot about everything but his safety. I rushed to his side and instructed our unwanted visitor to use her phone to call for help. But as soon as Eddie recovered, well, it was only going to get worse. In fact, everything worsened in the blink of an eye. Don't you see it? He desperately asked me. Do you seriously not see it? He pointed at the small container in the center of the lab where we studied the atoms that would create the energy necessary to open up a portal to a different dimension. But as far as I could see, everything looked normal. I started to get really scared. What if he had worked really too closely with the experiment? What if he could see something nobody else could? I looked at the controllers. I, I knew what I had to do, but, but I couldn't leave him alone. Go do what you have to do, the CIA woman told me. She must have noticed my hostile look at her, though. I'll take care of him, but you have to get this under control. If something bad happens, you won't be able to retire as the impeccable genius that I know you are. I immediately softened. She was actually trying to protect me. I left my partner in the hands of Jean, and I rushed to the main controllers of the lab. I executed one of the emergency codes, and in a matter of seconds, the entire laboratory was filled with an eerie red glow. That was the radiation scan. It would reveal our worst nightmares. When the scan was done, the three of us screamed. Now it was completely visible. The dangerous container in the center of the lab must have cracked. That immeasurable energy had slipped out of it and a nearly blinding light was coming out of it, spilling like liquid on the floor. It was an uncontrolled crack to a different dimension. My experiment worked, but at what price? It wasn't meant to happen like this. We needed to make it happen on the portal we could control. This way it was, it was so unpredictable and nearly impossible to close. But that wasn't all. The reason we screamed wasn't exactly that terrifying crack to an unknown dimension. Or the fact that it was visibly growing larger with every passing second. But the scariest, the scariest part was the other portals. Apparently that crack had been powerful enough to spill out of the container and unrestrained as it was, small sparks of energy had floated all over the laboratory. 
There were smaller but just as bright and just as dangerous cracks in the walls, the ceiling, and even floating in the air without anything to hold on to. It was like seeing the apocalypse contained in a single room. In this laboratory, reality as we knew it was over. A high-pitched scream broke me out of my thoughts. I turned around and I saw Jean was starting to slowly levitate above the floor. Eddie reached out to hold her, but somehow, instead of his hand, the three of us saw with absolute confidence the two pairs of right hands that grabbed Jean's arm. We screamed in fear again. It was official. Our dimension had been breached. We had collided with a parallel dimension, and the lines were getting blurred. I tried to run toward Eddie and Jean, but I was stopped by a pair of voices behind me. Sarah, stop! That's not real! It was Jean. But when I turned around, I didn't see anyone but the menacing portal in front of me. Come on, Sarah! We crossed the portal already! Come with us! It was Eddie, but I still didn't see anything. I turned around, but Eddie and Jean were nowhere to be found in the lab. Could it be real? Could they have crossed? Should I step into a different dimension? Oh, my heart was beating wildly in my chest. I was starting to feel sick like Eddie. This was my mind playing tricks on me? Were the walls melting? The floor shaking? My, my, my own skin changing color? I took one trembling step toward the interdimensional crack. And another. And another. But when I was about to continue, a hand fell on my arm and yanked me back into my reality. It was Jean, real and alive, and as frightened and sick as me. Eddie was crawling to the door of the lab. They were still here. Did, did um, did, did you hear that? I asked Jean. My voice was trembling. I can hear everything, <laughs> Jean replied. I noticed she was crying. This was a mind-bending experience. She was right. This wasn't madness. This was the space between realities. I could hear the echo of our words. I could hear my thoughts as loudly as hers. The worst part of the sounds that came from the crack between the two dimensions. I could hear my loved ones calling. I could hear monsters roaring. I could hear myself telling me to cross to the other side. Jean still had a hand on my shoulder, and I instinctively reached for her when, when, uh, when we heard a new sound. Um, it started out as a loud hiss, turning into something similar to radio static. Then it groaned and growled like a beast. We turned to look at the interdimensional portal as it was starting to grow even faster. The floor was crumbled around it. Machines were exploding. It was a disaster. It could be the end of everything. The two of us started running away and we found Eddie near the stairs. By the time we finally left the building, the ambulances, firefighters, and military vehicles were just arriving. Was it too late? My entire laboratory was on fire behind me.